It was three months ago today that Hamas attacked southern Israel, killing some 1,200 people and kidnapping about 240 more. Ever since, Israel has bombarded Gaza with the goal of eliminating Hamas. The Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry puts the Gaza death toll at nearly 23,000. And the United Nations says that as many as 40 percent of the casualties are children. About half the Gaza Strip's population is younger than 18. And as a new year begins, many of them have a simple wish. In 2024, I wish not to die. There is no bathroom, no food, and no drinking water. Our childhood is gone. This year is a nightmare for every child in Gaza, for every man and woman, for every elderly man and woman in Gaza. Earlier, I spoke with Jason Lee, the country director for the occupied territories for Save the Children. He was recently in Gaza. The situation in Gaza keeps deteriorating. Children, the families that are forced to flee their homes, you've got 1.9 million people. That's 85% of the population that have basically become homeless. I was in Rafah, and within three days, I saw the sheer number of civilians that fled south, putting up tents wherever they could, on the side of the roads, next to the hospitals. Again, there's a lack of food, there's lack of water, there is absolutely no primary health care, no health facilities are working. This is the situation that, that children in Gaza are facing right now. And every single day, it gets worse and worse. You say no primary health care facilities. What happens to children or to any Gazan who may be injured in the fighting or injured in the, in the, uh, the effort to get away from the fighting? Seven out of ten of the civilians that have been killed and injured has been a woman or a child. And these children have nowhere to go. The hospitals are completely full. They don't have enough supplies. There's not enough health care uh, workers. So the doctors, the nurses, they're performing examinations in corridors. The rooms are completely filled, overcrowded beyond belief. Patients are sleeping on the floor. Floors that are covered with blood and the damage that is all around. Again, these hospitals do not have the fuel to keep running. They don't have bandages. They don't have medicines. It is now unthinkable where majority of hospitals in Gaza are no longer functioning. Patients, children cannot go anywhere to get treatment for the injuries that they're sustaining. What is the situation? How dire is the situation about getting food into Gaza? The latest report on the food security indicates, again, the high levels of food insecurity throughout all of Gaza. Half, 50% of the population in Gaza, that's 1.1 million people, are at risk of starvation. Starvation cannot be used as a weapon of war. And we see this right now. Throughout all of the Gaza Strip, food availability is decreasing. Families are coping are resorting to negative coping mechanisms. My team report that in the north of Gaza, in Jabalia, civilians have started taking to hunting animals in the street just to find a meal. I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. Earlier you said that, that, uh, that starvation cannot be used as a weapon of war. Are you saying that you think Israel is deliberately doing this? What I can say and what I saw in Gaza is that there is not enough supplies coming in. We do not have free access throughout all of Gaza. When I was in Gaza for three successive days, all of our movement to the north was denied. We were not allowed to take any convoy of aid to the north of Wadi Gaza. And of course, the increased fighting does not allow for humanitarians to work. The Israeli military says they, they do work to try to minimize civilian casualties, and they blame Hamas for the civilian casualties, saying that they operate in these very densely packed civilian areas. What do you say to that? Gaza is one of the most densely populated places on Earth. It has 2.3 million people living in an area that is 365 square kilometers. And again, half of them, the population of Gaza, are children. Now, the forcible transfer or concentration of civilians into areas that cannot host them to satisfy military objectives is not trying to minimize civilian deaths. It is not protecting civilians. Forcing civilians to move when there is still active fighting, those areas cannot sustain life. It is not trying to protect civilians when you're forcing them to move into areas that cannot keep them alive.
Israel, with the, the support and backing of the United States, is reluctant or is resistant uh, to the idea of a humanitarian ceasefire. They're, they do talk about brief pauses uh, to allow humanitarian aid in. Is that enough? The ceasefire, a definitive and immediate ceasefire, is the only way to protect civilians, first and foremost, because it actually stops civilians from, from being continually killed and injured. It allows humanitarians to work. Pauses do not allow us to systematically bring the supplies and distribute them throughout all of Gaza Strip. We do not have enough personnel in Gaza to actually mount an effective and principled humanitarian action. Humanitarian pauses do not do enough. They do not protect civilians. They do not allow humanitarians to deliver assistance wherever civilians are throughout all of the Gaza Strip. Jason, are there, are there any first-hand experiences you had while you were in Gaza that you could, you could tell us about? When I was in Gaza, there was this horrific and horrible instance of a four-year-old girl that turned up to Wadi Gaza alone. We have no idea who she is, how she got to Wadi Gaza, um, or where she came from. Thankfully, we were able to find this four-year-old girl, take her to medical care, and she, this young child was in such a state of catatonic shock. Her skin was cold and clammy. We have no idea when she last ate and she wasn't speaking. She was non-responsive. We managed to get her some food, some, give her some juice, give some high protein biscuits and have a doctor check her out. But I still don't know if this child has regained speech. We have no idea who she is, if she's got any family left. The UN have estimated just in the UN shelters alone. And this is a rough indication that there are 2,000 children without parents, without family. We have not been able to look in the, in the shelters, the government shelters. We've not been able to look in the camps and the tents that are springing up all around Rafa right now. We need to find these children. We need to keep them safe. I understand you also visited a, a, a training center at Khan Yunus. I met this young family that were desperately trying to find milk for this baby. I don't know how old the baby was, probably about six months to one year. And unfortunately, the mother had died, buried under the rubble. And this family were trying to find milk for this baby that hadn't eaten for a day. This is just one story of the thousands and thousands of children that have been impacted by what is happening in Gaza right now. Jason Lee of Save the Children, thank you very much. Thank you.